report has revealed how a former Boko Haram fighter named Johanna Wilberforce became a staff of the Yola New Custodia Center in Adamawa State. The exclusive report by online media platform Premium Times says Johanna's Boko Haram background was detected following the dexterity he displayed with gun handling during training. While on training, he was found to have been more versatile in the use and operation of firearms than other prison staff. Upon further interrogation and collaborative findings, he reportedly confessed to have been abducted and held hostage by members of the Boko Haram for two years. Johanna also confessed to receiving training in heavy weapon handling from a Boko Haram base before he escaped their custody. A resident of Nigeria's capital, Labuja, its, envir its environs are now living under fear after terrorists attacked Kujie Correctional Facility and released hundreds of inmates, including notorious terrorists. The Kujie incident is just the latest in the series of jailbreaks that have happened under President Muhammadu Buhari's watch. Investigation reveals that there have been over 14 jailbreaks since 2015 when Muhammadu Buhari became the president. This number is more frightening if attacks on police stations are included in the statistics. Various reports show that while over 6,400 inmates had escaped in this incident, not more than 2,000 were recaptured. And for more discussions on this, we have now been joined in the studio by a retired uh, controller of corrections of uh, the Nigerian Correctional Service and uh, the immediate past uh, National Public Relations Officer of the service, that's Francis Nobore. And uh, from our off-site studio, we have Adewale Ajadi. He is a lawyer and a public affairs analyst. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight on the program. And of course, I want to start with you, Francis, here in the studio with us. Um, 14 jailbreaks since 2015, 6,400 inmates escaped and barely 2,000 recaptured, at least from official records. Would you say this is a reflection of the dire situation when it concerns security in Nigeria? A reflection of the uh, insecurity in the nation? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I like to choose a convenient entry point to this discourse uh, by looking at the general insecurity that is uh, unfortunately plaguing the nation. Uh, you recall that uh, since they uh, started having these uh, uh, um, insurgents attacking both soft and, and uh, hard locations, uh, we've uh, witnessed a number of uh, attacks you know, on different formations across the country. It's quite unfortunate, there's no doubt about that. And uh, particularly looking at it from the uh, angle of releasing hardened criminals into the society. There's no doubt about that. Uh, well, I, w w what happened in Kujie and the previous uh, experiences we've had just brings to the fore the need for everybody to get on board, for us as a nation to collectively reassess and appraise our response strategy to distress situations, to insecurity. We know what is BESA. You talk about in, in security arrangement, you talk about how to detect, how to deter, how to delay, how to deny, and then you, before you talk about defense. In each of these layers, how are we prepared to respond? What, where we fail to detect, how do we deter? If we fail that block, how do we deny? If we fail at that level, how do we delay? And then we now talk about response. Now, talking specifically about the invasion on Consider Center, on several occasions we've come out to say that, look, the Consider facilities we have in the country, we need to be for the uh, uh, structural you know, positioning. In 2019, we had this Nigerian Correctional Service Act 2019. Section 9, subsection 3, specifically spells out buffer area, creation of buffer areas around custodial facility. What, do, what does that buffer area you know, do? It provides enough 
um, uh, a space for whoever is on guard duty to process and assess whoever is approaching the custodial center. If the person is a foe, you know how to engage that fellow. And it spells out that not less than 100 meter radius around a custodial center should be maintained where you have no structure, no, no, no tree, no nothing. What this uh, signifies is that you are supposed to have two layers of uh, perimeter fence. The first is to stave off the attacker. The inner one enables whoever is on observation tower to engage whoever is approaching. But we have not been able to actualize that in most of our consular centers across the country. If, if, I, if I may just quickly ask you, you know, stating that the response strategy has been very faulty and uh, that obviously would have accounted, you know, uh, for the uh, complete invasion or overrunning of the Kujé Correctional Center and other centers that have been invaded, you know, by gunmen, terrorists and uh, their likes and the rest. What is the government not doing right? Yes. Um, they say unusual situations should naturally demand unusual approach. Now, since 2009, when we started having this insurgency, everybody knows that a day will come where we'll have aggression of them, you know, arrested, kept in somewhere. I'm saying this because we still have hardened criminals in our custody. We still need to protect them, we still need to keep them in safe uh, environment. <laughs> We need to respond doing something out of the ordinary. We have, yes, the, the, the government as part of the response was to initiate uh, the 3,000 capacity ultra modern custodial centers uh, in, each, uh, in each of the six geopolitical zones across the country. We have one uh, almost 90% uh, or 95% uh, completed now. We have another one coming up in. in uh, in the, the FCT here, and uh, River State, Ditto, the other three as, uh, geopolitical zones. But the pace at which these structures are going is, to, to me, I, I, I don't feel comfortable about it. We are faced with an unusual, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 incidents, attacks of these insurgents. Let us expedite action in putting these structures in place. So that you, when you have hardened uh, criminals like this, you can take them to safe environment where uh, the buffer area, like I said, is uh, can be maintained. You have enough lighting. You have the structures are strong enough to withstand the caliber of people in custody. So these are things, and we need to also uh, reinforce our information generation. A, a strategy that is intelligence everybody must get involved intelligence intelligence is one uh, critical area well Adewale, i want to come to you in our offside studio right now you have heard francis he's actually listed some of the issues and what he feels are partly the solution to the issue but let's look at it generally atiku abubakar uh the candidate of the pdp said non-prosecution of terrorists arrested is probably fueling insecurity and also even leading to this jailbreak that we've seen become so incessant do you agree with his stance that we need to fast track their prosecution and maybe might avoid such a situation from happening like what we saw a few days ago in kujie well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I think that he, I, I wouldn't agree entirely with him. I'm not sure what his angle is, but there is a need for reform of the criminal justice system. 70% of the prisoners or more in our jail systems are under detention, are awaiting trial. That is not sustainable. It hasn't been sustainable. This has been happening forever in our country. The fundamental issue is that the reforms of 2019, if properly implemented, goes a long way in terms of the prison services, but there needs to be work done on the judiciary. The, the capacity of the judiciary to process, to, to decide cases, to fast track cases, the detention of people for 10 years, 12 years, sometimes 20 years, um, um, before their trial is completed or even initiated, is unsustainable. But I don't think that you can reform overnight. I don't think that, you know, let's look at it honestly. 
A government that is struggling to raise revenue because we pay so little taxes and we generate so little at the moment, is going to find it difficult to justify investing a lot on the criminal justice system. We have other priorities. So there are challenges and the implementation process is going to take some time. But having said that, we have to be wary and concerned about the fact that we are making some progress in the Northeast, displacing these terrorists and, and they're coming further down south. The government should have been prepared for that danger and should be ready for that danger. But the overcrowding of our prisons, the, the, the fact that the, the prisons are supposed to take half of usually the people that we put in there is unsustainable. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Adewale. Let me return to you, Francis, with your vast experience, you know, as a controller, a retired controller of uh, corrections and uh, former spokesperson. How correctional would you say the correctional centers are in Nigeria? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I like to say that um, the Nigerian Correctional Service, as the name implies corrections, uh, have, having migrated from the punitive um, status it was years back uh, to where it is now, that the service is able to minister reformation and rehabilitation uh, programs to inmates or offenders behind bars. I can say uh, with all uh, certainty that the service has in recent time responded favorably to the needs of inmates in our custody. The, we, uh, let us uh, start with educational opportunities. Okay. We, as at the last count, we're having well over 1,000 inmates running different degree programs in, uh, 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 behind bars. Six of them, to be specific, are doing their doctorate program. This is in addition to sundry vocations that are given to um, uh, inmates to, uh, to be trained in different skills. I tell you, sir. Whether they are waiting trial, whether they are uh, uh, convicts already or are waiting trials, do you give them the same uh, the, opportunity, the uh, rights to education, the rights to acquire knowledge and skills? Yes, uh, tactically, no. Not everybody. Mm -hmm. In the sense that those that are awaiting trial for heinous crimes, and you, the, if the officer in charge of the facility knows that he cannot guarantee safety if he releases them to workshop to train, he will not do it. But because we have well over 72, 73 percent of those that are in custody awaiting trial, you cannot just lock people forever to vegetate behind bars without uh, giving opportunity for them to train. So some of them bend of, uh, uh, over to give skeletal opportunities for those that are waiting for Using their discretion. Their discretion. This is discretionary. Yeah, it's, discre it's discretionary. Otherwise, uh, as it is structured, those that are eligible to be trained in other vocational uh, skills or uh, uh, given the op uh, opportunity to advance their educational uh, you know, uh, uh, chances are those that have been convicted. And it is... It is clear you cannot rehabilitate someone that is, uh, that is seen as innocent. If you are dead as an awaiting trial, you are still presumed as, as a, 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 a well, innocent. We get your point. With, an, AW, with an AWT that is there for 10, 20 years, as pointed out by Adewale. Quite troubling, that <laughs> statistics, honestly. Over 70% awaiting trial. Adewale, I want to come back to you right now. Well, Francis, you talked about what we're doing in there, but reintegration into society. One wonders if you can point to one or two of them who've gone through this correctional facilities and are, you know, uh, not nuisance to the society, but Adewale, as a legal practitioner, um, our correctional centers are notoriously congested and, of course, grossly unmanned. Dispensation of criminal justice. You touched on it a little bit earlier, Rob, but I want to get you to talk to us about, yes, it's a holistic change that we need, but what are the key areas we need to start working on in terms of change so that way we avoid such a situation where over 70% of our inmates are still awaiting trial, some over 20 years. Thank you very much. I think it's an issue of the speed of trial and the processing of people through our court systems. 
and the speed of prosecution. It's untenable. The fact that most judges still write longer and it's also untenable. We have to find a way and a system that allows us to speedily try people, to use all the technology that is available to us, to make sure that trials and processing of people through the, the judicial process is fast. I mean, we in fact believe in law that justice delayed is justice denied. How can you put someone in detention for 10 years? How, 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 it's plainly ridiculous. It's untenable, it's unsustainable. You have actually punished the person even though you are presuming them to be innocent. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a source of great anger. And it's something that somehow or the other, we have to find the resources to prioritize. Because we are creating problems. And then we then react after the thing has happened. We say, OK, the, there's prison break. But if you overload the prison, and you create a situation where the structures are not sustainable, and then you complain after the fact, and then you blame, you blame one party or the other. I'm, I'm sick and tired of us finding someone to blame. It's about time all of us across the board took an holistic stance about how we create a society that's not fit for purpose. The, our judicial system is currently not fit for purpose. If people have been in jail for years, who would have not been prosecuted? It's not sustainable. I don't know. I mean, it's insensing to just listen to us talk about it after the thing has happened. We have seen this thing coming for years. I mean, we recently had a popular guy, a bachelor's um, 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 ADC or whatever it was, senior military guy, in jail for nine years while his case was being processed. That's not a sustainable way of handling in a, in a country like ours. So we need to get, make sure that the courts have a speed of processing, that we use technology wherever possible, that we don't load everything on judges and they don't load everything on themselves, that there are checks and balances through the system, that lawyers take responsibilities for not delaying and putting in motions that are necessary to delay cases, that we recruit people into the justice system, that we make sure that we professionalize the paralegal services for, across the board, the support systems. We put in place probational services. We put in place non-custodial sentences that can be acted. And then we put parallel cases for smaller offenses outside the court system so that they can be properly handled quickly. We need a proper reform of our judicial system. We don't fix things in prison. By the time you get to prison, it's too late. Really too late indeed. But uh, let me turn to Francis again. Would you say it is uh, too late to the kind of uh, memorandum of understanding that the British government was, uh, was going to or had suggested for the federal government about repa repatriating some Nigerian prisoners from the UK to your correctional centers. With the state of the correctional centers, how, you know, uh, germane is such a repatriation? Uh, thank you. The MOU on uh, migration uh, uh, returns uh, was signed uh, in February this year. Um, the issues, uh, you know, that were raised uh, had to do with the state of our infrastructure, the what we have on ground to uh, reform and rehabilitate offenders that are in our custody. They also raised the issue of early releases. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, interesting to note that these three issues that were raised in the MOU have all been meant by uh, the Nigerian government. It's not because of the MOU that the Nigerian government rushed to put these things in place because it actually uh, started way back in 2018 when the concept of uh, building 3,000 ultra-modern uh, correctional centers started and then uh, many more were rehabilitated. The early releases that they also uh, raised uh, issue about, we have it now in our uh, uh, Nigeria Correctional Service Act 2019. Uh, we have provisions for parole, uh, which uh, was of a great concern to them because they, they didn't want a situation where someone sentenced to uh, a term of imprisonment will end up spending the entire period behind bars. The issue of rehabilitation and reformation that they also talked about, I told you that we have a robust educational program uh, that we uh, give uh, opportunities to inmates that are so interested and of course we also encourage them to go in to uh, uh, avail themselves 
uh, in addition to sundry vocations that are available for them to be trained. So those issues have been met. There's no problem about uh, that uh, MOU. Um, it's a pity that this unfortunate incident of Kujie happened. Otherwise, there have been a paradigm shift from what the correctional service used to be in the past to a, a, a phase where we're beginning to sing, uh, you know, songs of success. It's just well, unfortunate that that uh, Francis, some would argue and say, Nigeria, our problem is not lack of laws, but it's implementation of said laws. Because you talked about what is available. Most Nigerians don't even know that we have parole available in the country. But let's wrap up this conversation right now um, with Adewale, who is in our, our off-site studio. Let's look at the fact that, you know, there's been accusations of connivance, you know, of... Uh, Correctional officers and other security agents in these correctional services with some inmates, we hear that privileges can even be bought in there. Means that some of these jailbreaks, if some of these things are not checked, we might see a reoccurrence. But let me ask you as we wrap up this conversation, what would you say will be the way forward to avoid more jailbreaks in the future in Nigeria? Well, thank you for asking that question again. I mean, the reality is that we have to give um, um, respect where it's due. The government has done some things. But we're not going to get into a zero defect situation. There's always going to be the tension with jailbreaks in this country. I mean, the, until you have the numbers, until you start to sort out prisoners, you professionalize the process of sorting out medium security from um, high security prisoners, and then protecting high security prisoners heavily, making sure that people in detention are kept away from people who are collective prisoners, not overcrowding the spaces. There's going to be challenges, and it's not going to happen overnight. If we lie to ourselves, we're, we're just playing with this issue. There's going to be this risk for the foreseeable future until the structures that we have are changed, until the process of, of the judicial system is changed, until we know how to do things incrementally and manage spaces. You know, there's so many things we can talk about in terms of what are the things that are used to build, build it, um, the buildings we have and all of that, but that's just a distraction. There's an entire process. We have to be patient of that process. We have to know, and we forget this. There's a risk, so long as the armed forces are successful in the north, these terrorists will find softer targets and find easier ways to attack us. And that is never going to stop until the, the insurgency stops. So every time we need to be of one resolve that we are going to end this insurgency, whatever they do. We need to be of resolve that all Nigerians are a priority. We need to support the government on issues like this and not be divided, whatever the terrorists do. Because their goal is to divide us and turn us against each other. So divide long as we conquer. do that, we will win. The well, thanks so more. very much, uh, Adewale Ajadi, as a lawyer and a public affairs analyst for the uh, great insights you've given. And right here in uh, Art Studios, Francis Enobore is a former spokesman and uh, retired controller of uh, Corrections, Nigerian Correctional Centre. Thanks, gentlemen, for being part of Newsnight.